Hi, everybody. Kicking it off, my name is Kevin. You may have remember me from last week. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, this is our second of two installments of uh, Stories from the River, where we're just getting the ball rolling on learning about motivational interviewing with the uh, keeping in mind that we're going to be with you in person to go into depth, including experiences and practices around the best way of doing in my. So uh, last week we reviewed, we talked about uh, really the basics. Uh, this will be our same plan for today. Uh, just the idea that this is a learning community, that the best way to learn motivational interviewing is together in some way, and that our hope will be that uh, your group will find the, the best way that it does that. Starting with this uh, Zoom format, we continue to have this Zoom format at, at noon with previous uh, trainings, previous classes. Learners come in at noon. Uh, actually, tomorrow we're gonna have another uh, edition of it where uh, people who have been through the training already come back into the Zoom land and we present a small topic, but then also create an environment, a space where people can talk about their efforts to try to make motivational interviewing happen in their own work. And if they've had struggles or maybe even victories, successes with how that's gone, um, we want to open it up to that. So that's something that'll be available to you moving forward as well. Um, before I get into any kind of content, uh, mindful that I had, you know, we presented some of the basics of content last week, uh, particularly the spirit of motivational interviewing, that it's a guiding style of communication that is simply designed to empower people. It is not a recipe. It is not a manualized treatment. It's a way of doing help. So that it is designed to be, um, it is designed to be adapted to any kind of protocols you may have uh, at your workplace. So it shouldn't be seen as a new, something new to add on your plate that's all uh, an already full plate. It's hopefully intended to be a way of interacting with people who have mixed feelings about making change. Because they, they've done a lot of evidence-based practice on this in the West and to the point where they found that this is uh, an, a, a, an effective means of trying to do help at a, especially in a systems level at, at clinics, institutions, social services, et cetera. It's about being respectful and curious in a way that facilitates change, but also honors autonomy. It's a really important point of the spirit of motivational interviewing. Again, the spirit of motivational interviewing, we will we continue to emphasize that um, uh, the any kind of techniques or mechanics, you know, helpful hints around how to be in an MI way really ring hollow if there is not the spirit of connection and genuine partnership, a desire to truly understand where another person is coming from. And that entails uh, acceptance. Um, empathy is a huge part of that, that ongoing practice of being able to listen well and express that we can be with a person in 100% acceptance without judgment and compassion. And that by doing that, as professional people, by being with clients and each other in that way, that it is an empowering experience. So before I dive into anything new, I thought I'd just like open it up to the floor. Um, we have a question here. It has been asked if we can get copies of, absolutely, we can get, we can get you copies of this information. Of course, there's gonna be a ton of information coming your direction when we arrive for the training, but uh, I'll talk to the team as well about getting like, you know, for example, the slide I just showed about the spirit of MI, we can absolutely send these slides on to share with you. All of this information is intended to be shared 
there's a tremendous amount of material online as well. Um, I am a fan of Googling, though it can end up being like a fire hose and I get very overwhelmed at the same time. <laughs> so uh, I'd be happy to send along these slides that Kevin actually prepared, Kevin Simmons prepared this. Our training team consists of myself, Kevin Simmons. Kevin says, yes, we can package up all the information and send to you all. Uh, and then my auntie, Kathleen Tomlin, is also on the, on the training team, uh, along with AJ Goins from the state of Oregon. Um, we will all be there in person to uh, join you and discuss in depth the ins and outs of motivational interviewing. Before I get into anything new, I'm wondering if anybody has any, uh, you know, we ended last time with um, knowledge that we're gonna come back here in a week and I invited you to consider how could this fit in your workplace, even now, even with just the beginnings of a conversation. I know some of you do have experience with MI and some of you may be brand new to it, but I'm just curious how this week went anything occurred to you where you might have questions or maybe even some positive experiences, victories, trying it out, things that you have learned? Is there anything anybody has that they'd like to bring up before I get into my own material? I'm looking at the chat too. No questions? Okay. So if not, I'm just going to get into a uh, more of an overview and then have a little bit of a taste of MI. Um, before we hit the end of this hour, I want to be mindful of our time as well that we're just, I know that you guys are having lunch and I want to respect that time. So sharing my screen. Here's a sneak preview of the slide deck that you will see. We're bringing this with us. So this is actually a preview. These are officially not released to you slides yet. But um, there have some visuals that I'd like to share around how motivational interviewing is described by the authors. It's certainly a trauma-informed approach. I'm zooming through a lot of these to get to this. Uh, there's the basic text of motivational interviewing is, uh, is out there. And uh, there's actually a brand new edition coming out in August that we just learned is on pre-order. Um, it is not required to buy that basic text. If you're a textbook person and you learn from reading and you have the means to do it, I mean, I certainly don't not recommend it, but uh, this, this is their definition of what motivational is. A person-centered counseling style for addressing the common problem of ambivalence about change. That is really all it is. Motivational interviewing in theory is very simple. That we encounter clientele who are going through change in their life. And as with any human being, if you're facing a change, you probably have mixed feelings about it. So motivational interviewing is a strategic way of being person-centered and helping that person stay in that big word, ambivalence. There's a mantra we have in, as MI practitioners, that they're ambivalent. If I'm having difficulty with a client's behavior and they're not making it about me, they're ambivalent. If they're ambivalent, then motivational interviewing is the prescription. It is the means of engaging the person. So there's some key assumptions behind motivational interviewing. Really the most important thing we wanna emphasize for these, these preliminary conversations is that there is a spirit behind MI. It's not just technique, but that it is founded on compassion, uh, partnership or collaboration, and this understanding of people that we affirm them. 
that we listen carefully so that we can reflect with accurate empathy as much as we can. And that we um, emphasize that the people we work with, even though we may have a genuine and correct bias that they need to change, that first and foremost, they're, they are human beings worthy of respect and autonomy. They get to have free choice. So where I may be biased for them to go one direction, I'm going to partner with them and walk along beside them as they sit in indecision about how or whether they're going to make that choice. And that ultimately each person has absolute worth. And that by engaging people in that way, we find that it creates a space where the reasons for making the change will come out of the mouths of the people we're working with. And that this is just a human thing. If you, if you treat people with respect and emphasize their free will and autonomy, that, that, that gives them the freedom to discuss not only the reasons to not change, but also on the other hand, there are really good reasons to change and they're all mixed up together. And so we often hear that information all jumbled together in one big paragraph and that it is our job as MI practitioners to focus on those parts of the speech that are their own reasons for making the change. I'm gonna check the chat here. Sitting in indecision, absolutely. The, 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 there's a video that we show that is an example of this idea of having mixed feelings about doing something, uh, about sitting in ambivalence. It's one of the most uncomfortable human experiences that there is. So much so that we would rather not have indecision. It can be very inviting to back off from a change and just kind of say, eh, never mind. And that in that way, it's a form of resolving the tension. It's resolving the indecision. Even if I decide, eh, screw this, I give up. That can that is a, a frequent human decision that relieves the tension. So in many ways, uh, being with a person who is an indecision without trying to push them in any direction can be a really uncomfortable experience. That's a really good point. I'm gonna move on a little bit here. Some of all the, oh, these slides have transitions on them. So there's all of this stuff on spirit that we're gonna cover in depth together, but there's another piece of this that I'd like to share. There are four main tasks of motivational interviewing. Sometimes they're known as processes, but really it's just as when I engage in another per with another person um, in any kind of professional capacity, it's just like a staircase. So the first step is engagement. Uh, connection. My uh, professional training is in uh, addictions. I'm an addictions counselor by trade. And so the change that they, I mean, I, I'm kind of, from an MI point of view, it's pretty clear cut in my world what the changes that people are facing, whether they want it or not. It's written over the doorway. Recovery. People are facing a decision about drugs and alcohol. Before I can even get to that specific change question, I need to get connected to them. The opposite of a addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. We hear that out in the world a lot and that that is something that it's very congruent with motivational interviewing. That connection is the foundation upon which anything else that happens in MI happens. So how do we do that engaging? through reflective listening. And these are the four core skills of motivational interviewing. Open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. So in many ways, it seems like a martial art. There's just, there's not many, there's not a lot of complexity in motivational interviewing. It just comes down to four main moves. Honoring patient autonomy, 
Mastering detachment from several various outcomes, says Maurice. That's such a great way to put it. So much of learning MI has to do with um, my own mindset. Is my own mind right when I come into uh, a session or an encounter with the person that I'm trying to help? If I have a tidy mind, that my mind is not in disarray, then I have a much better chance of it arriving at that detachment from the outcome that is really essential in order to be able to effectively do these four core skills. So um, open-ended question. Can anybody give me an example of uh, an open-ended question? Or maybe what it isn't. What helped you stay sober the last time? Yeah, so a what question. What helped you stay sober last time? Now that can, uh, I appreciate how that stays open because the, it's not like I can say, it's not like a math equation. I can't say 42, you know, or just one word. Or maybe I say one word, but that's going to require unpacking. Like AA, well, tell me about that. You know, it begins that process of drawing information out from people. So a, that's anything that is what or how. Questions that are designed to get a person to try to explain their reality in a little more richness, a little more detail. It's an open-ended question. The other three moves here, affirmations, reflections, and summaries are all versions of uh, communicating to a person um, that we're accurately listening to what they have to say. So with the about 15 minutes of time we have left, I thought we might go into an exercise that's really simple. I'm going to put a blurb up on the screen that we can all, all read through it. And then we're just going to try to go through these core skills as a group and just brainstorm. How would I do open-ended questions? How would I affirm? How would I reflect? How would I summarize? So let me get this. Okay. So, are there any questions about ORS? O-A-R-S, open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. Anybody heard of it? It's hard for me to see the window here. Yes, I've heard of it. Okay. Okay, so this is a, this is actually right out of the text. It's an example situation where we have a hypothetical client who's coming to me. I'm not really exactly sure what it's, what it's for, but uh, we don't need that. When, uh, often when we meet a person for the first time, we're not exactly sure what it is they're looking to change. So instead of just diving right in and asking them, well, what do you need to change? We start by asking them, what is it that brings you here? Which is another, it's, it's a good example of an open-ended question. So I'm going to read through this and just, you can follow along and then we're going to go through the oars on this. I have been feeling really unhappy lately in my relationship. I've been with my husband for 15 years and I love him, but I don't know if I'm in love with him anymore. He's a wonderful father. And I don't think I want a separation or anything because I don't want to do that to my children. It's not like he's an awful husband either. I'm just not happy. I'm only 43 years old. I'm not ready to give up and just be unhappy for the rest of my life. And if things stay the way they are right now, that's what my future looks like. I feel so stupid because I have a really good life. I wish I could just get over it and learn how to be happy. So if we're thinking am I, we're thinking ors. First of all, if this person is ambivalent, what do you think that they might be looking at changing in their life? Just hypothetically, what does it seem like this person is seeking services for? Relationship, um, yeah. happier self-love, I don't know. Yeah. 
in the big room. Oh well, no age. So yeah, change of life, mental health, transition, adjustment. Yeah, I I feel like the the individual would be geared towards motivation of like finding out how this situation has interfered with their life. Yes. Yeah, that's what it seems. That's where it seems like it's going. And so, from right. a motivational interviewing point of view, we know ultimately we want to get it narrowed down as much as possible to one thing. Like, what is one thing that this person can change? But before we can do that, we need to connect with her. Without that connection, it's really hard for somebody to open up. And the means of that connection is through the ORs. So I'm wondering what it is that you might try to respond to say in response to a person who gives you the these set of reasons to change, reasons to stay the same. How might you offer a reflection to this person? Um, I would probably say, could you tell me about a typical day you're having? And um during this day, where you know, could you tell me if you were drinking? Sure. Okay. So going specifically in one direction toward drinking. Um, so you're asking for a little more information from them. Right. But I'm also over here on the chemical dependency side. Sure. So, oh, right, right. That's okay. Yeah. Thank you for reminding in me. The, of that. In the healthcare facility. <laughs> right. So they're walking through where the agenda is written on the door. <laughs> so right. there is an understanding there that, that uh, it that it's going to have something to do with alcohol. Well, let's say that this is the example of like somebody does do that. They walk through the door. It's drug and alcohol treatment. And this is what they say. So if I were to slow it down and just keep it only on this language, this is one part of MI is just to slow it down, even though I know it's going to eventually get to drugs and alcohol somehow, if it's, that's where they're at. If, I, if I'm just matching where the person is in this paragraph, how would I reflect what they're saying back to them? I would say, well, it sounds to me that you really value your happiness, your family life, and you're trying to come to um, a decision mm. about where you're going. I don't know, that would be my affirmation. That's That's just- Yeah. Yeah, great. I mean, exactly. Affirmations. We know that an affirmation is just a type of reflection, right? It's reflecting back to a person a strength that we recognize or that the person has said about themselves. So a simple version of, a ref of an affirmation type of reflection is you value your happiness. That there's actually a positive side to this. And that you might even be adding a little bit to the background of that, that might complexify that uh, affirmation. That we know that those affirmations are one of the most powerful types of reflection we can do in motivational interviewing. So yeah, absolutely. To recognize any kind of positive attribute or strength that they're demonstrating in their words or in their activity. It's a good one, thank you. What else? Other kinds of reflections, I mean, even like more simple ones, things that you see written down up here that they said that you might want to emphasize to them to communicate that you are listening. So <clears throat> kind of relating to the story, I've been in my marriage for 15 years and I'm very happy, so but we always make sure we make time for each other. And I don't know if maybe that's something. She said that they have children and they're he's a great dad and husband. So maybe they're just not spending enough time together to where they can still keep that bond. Great. So you gotta there's uh you got a hot lead on what may perhaps that's uh an avenue for change, right? So perhaps one thing, one way to do that, how would you phrase that as a reflection. So instead of asking a question about that to somebody, if I listen to what they say in here and that's what I'm hearing, uh, what would it look like to communicate that back to them? 
Maybe asking if they can remember the last time that they were happy with their partner. Yeah. Absolutely. So asking for exceptions. Asking for asking if so if I ask it, can you remember a time? That is that's an example of even though it's a closed question, because technically I could say yes or no, but really it's very evocative because it's calling back on exceptions to the reason they're coming in to see services. And uh, it's hearkening back to happier times. So hopefully what that would do is uh, draw out deeper information. Because when they talk about when times were good, yeah. we're going to hear exceptional experiences. Somebody else going to share? So that would, I was not able to unmute for a second there. But so that would be kind of like combining consultations, right? So you, mm -hmm. could, you could develop a sense of what other referrals and resources need to be implemented into this treatment plan by asking these questions and sharing these resources at the same time. Absolutely, absolutely. The thing with motivational interviewing is that we will absolutely end up with resources and that'll be a skill that gets addressed when we come in person to the event where there's a way of, you know, that when we uh, arrive at that moment in providing services where we need to give information especially you know a classic example is giving resources there's a motivational interviewing uh style of exchanging information that continues to keep that spirit of mi going so that spirit of partnership of autonomy and it is as simple as this um after somebody says something like this it's like it sounds like you may be in need of some resources and maybe they would say yes and i say well would it be okay with you um i have some ideas around that i have some resources would you be interested in those resources so even though it seems obvious to ask some form of permission from the person would it be okay if i provided you with information and that even goes for advice. You know, we typically we hear that advice is bad unless the advice is desired by the other person. So if you get a sense that this person wants direction, advice, education, it's OK to ask. In fact, it's kind of called for because what that does is it, it puts the ball in the court of the client. And that client has the freedom to say no. So you got to kind of wait for them to actually answer the question. Maybe they don't want it. But um, the autonomy of being able to say yes. And then you provide the information and then follow up with, uh, how do you think you'll use this information? Or does this make sense to you? In other words, asking them again, is there anything that we may have missed in this? So. There's a sense of I'm not just handing you a pamphlet saying good luck that there's a partnership there that comes out of a sense of connection. So exchanging information there is is something that we'll cover for sure. Right. And we always want to be like, you know, we're in a small community. Everybody knows everybody. So it's really important on on my side over here at Yellow Hawk with the mandated clients that I really try to accept, right? Accept, have, practice with acceptance and then also accountability. And then I um, try to be aware and, you know, get supervision. I think I shared this at the end of the last class or the last session mm -hmm. is that um, to get the supervision when I'm dealing with, um, you know, issues with transference and counter transference, because a lot of the times a client or even somebody out in the community will remind me of somebody that I know mm -hmm. personally. So when I go to share these resources, it's always important that I do not put these um, expectations on these clients because mm -hmm. of something that I've already been through personally and that I don't 
um, mirror that information and transfer this information onto these clients. Even though I might be going through something, it doesn't right. mean that this my situation is going to fit into this client's situation, right? Like they're yeah. not, and I, and I shouldn't take that personal. Absolutely. So I trying to meet the client where they're at, but um, also trying to like convey the message um, mm -hmm. that, you know, we're here for this reason. If you, if you need um, outside resources, we could do those referrals um, kind of like, I guess it would be kind of like a case management type of situation, but with not, not with everybody so involved. And so sometimes that could be a little bit draining, but hmm. I've been working on that and um, trying to develop a system on my own to where I can try to avoid these situations. A lot of the times I don't, um, I'm not able to avoid that. And so um, I just kind of roll with the punches, right? Roll mm -hmm. with the client. And so that's, that's where it's going to have to be at until, um, you know, things change. And that's okay. Absolutely. It's part of the reason why in uh, motivational interviewing, uh, like you said, staying with the client where they're at, it's so inviting to run ahead of them. Uh, for those exact reasons, we might get caught up because they remind us of ourselves, even subconsciously, like that counter transference that you're talking about. It could just be maybe they're in crisis. I mean, there is that part of us that we need to assess for safety. That's that's presumed in MI that, you know, we're presuming in a situation like this where we're seeing this paragraph that I have the luxury of being able to take a step back and slow it down with this person because they're not in a crisis. They're not in an emergency. So of course we got to do that safety check and presuming that that safety is in place, then I have the freedom to kind of sit back a bit and really take in only the things that this person is saying right now. Cause really nothing in this statement is asking for anything. They're not asking for anything yet. They're saying how they feel. I feel really unhappy. They give us some information. I've been with my husband for 15 years. We have this sense they did get focused on is that she loves her husband. It's not like she's a bad person. You know, these are examples of reflections. Like she's not saying that, but that might be something that just occurred to me that I might add if i reflect you love your husband and you're not a bad person that is a form of a reflection that's complex because i'm adding that piece and the beauty part of any kind of guess that is part of what we do when we reflect is that what do i perceive with this person and it and if i reflect it back to them in a guess form even if i'm wrong it gives them the opportunity to correct me which is a win because it gets them to talk about themselves and help and um, teach us what it is really like to be them in their ambivalent struggle. So the experience becomes, it feels like it's going much slower than it is from our point of view, because we know where we wanna take them. And the fact is they're starting where they're at. And so to just sit in that moment with them is often the task of reflective listening. So this is just one taste. I'm really, I'm mindful of the time. So before we adjourn, I would just wanted to throw it open to anybody else who might have a comment or a reflection on this. Any experience with doing ORs in this way? I was just gonna say, I like um, this scenario that you gave. Um, I think it is really helpful. Um, I think it is difficult, like as a caseworker, because I wanna solve your problems. And so everything you're saying is like all the things I've ever been through. Like, I know the answer, oh my God, I wanna help you. Like I have so many services, but that's not even what we're doing right now. Like that's down the road. Right. So I have to like remind myself to stop and listen <clears throat> and actually like listen, you know, to them and be reflective. I usually say things like, tell me more about that or tell me things. Like I usually start with tell me 
instead of like, can I blah, 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 because in the, I work with kids and they'll yeah. So I usually say, tell me about that time when blah, blah, blah happened. Um, so I'd say, tell me things. And then also, I'm trying to what else I can say with it. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I just thought that was helpful. I do think it is difficult when you want to solve their problems, but that's really not like where we're at on the first day. So totally. Yeah, it feels like uh, it feels uh, slow. You know, yeah. uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, I mean, that's like a pro tip. Tell me about. That's really, even though it sounds like like it looks like a command on the page, that's an open question. It's inviting someone to describe things. And that's what we're trying to do at an engagement level in motivational interviewing. I would just like to hear a person describe their own life. So even if they're giving me a bunch of negative, from this point of view, that's okay. I'm going to keep reflecting that. I'm not going to stay on it, but if that's where we begin, then that's where we begin. You're not happy. It's not like I'm going to wallow in it and cuddle the problem with, with them, but it, it, there is a moment where uh, people experience validation just when, when they understand that, oh, this person really is listening, right? And it often becomes one step in a ladder on the way toward ultimately getting down to the nitty gritty, like the focus of, okay, what's really going on here? Like once this paragraph kind of gets exhausted where I engage with a person, maybe over about 15 minutes, might feel like forever, <laughs> but just reflecting back, reflecting back. And then maybe that kind of conversation starts lulling out and she's like, yep, yep, yep. And I might take a break, take a breath. And if she doesn't say anything back, Another great open-ended question is, what else? Especially when you think like the whole conversation is exhausted, especially with young ones, they always got something more, but often they need to be invited to say it. So that open question of what else? That's one of my favorite pro tips, by the way, especially if you're running a group and it seems dead, what else? It resets the table. And people might be able to bring up something else, maybe something that they actually are more wanting to talk about, even though they feel like it maybe it wasn't appropriate to the situation. Well, we can invite them to talk about what they really want to talk about. Because it all goes toward connection. So the more connected we get, the better chance we get that we can help that person arrive at those arguments for making a positive change in their life. So it's a slow process, it's a deliberate process, but it's also the fastest process we know of to help a person get at like legit change. Okay, I'm definitely a guide, direct and follow. Yes, those are the three styles of MI. We're gonna get into that for sure too. There's no rules in MI, so it's not like direction isn't allowed. Like we can tell people what to do if they give us permission to do that. If they say, I, I'm, I am not, I don't have mixed feelings. I'm ready. Tell me what to do. I don't know what to do. Then I'm not going to wallow in their feelings with them. <laughs> I'm going to give them my expertise because they asked for it. Often people aren't at that spot yet. They need to be, the, uh, well, they tell us what they need when they, with the words that they use to describe their life. So I am mindful of the time. I think we've run out of time. But I'm really looking forward to meeting you guys in person. We're going to have two days together, do some motivational interviewing. Excited for it. Thank you.